Morning. Um, my work has been the recipient of gushing accolades for over 50 years. The New York Times wrote the brash. George Lois was the agent provocateur who triggered American advertising's creative revolution in the 1960s. The Wall Street Journal said George Lois is a genuine advertising superhero. Time Magazine called me a media renaissance man. New York Magazine called me the Superman of the Madison Avenue. America's Magic Communicator. And MoMA said I had been the originator of a new audacious art form. But on the Today Show, about 20 years ago or more, Gene Shalit, in his infinite wisdom, really identified the essence of my contributions to American popular culture when he exclaimed, to read George Lois on advertising is to read Leonardo da Vinci on art, Julius Caesar on warfare, Ted Williams on, hit on hitting, and Clifford Irving on fraud. <laughs> Clifford Irving wrote the book. Of, oh, you're all so young. <laughs> he wrote a book on, on Howard Hughes, and he, and he said he had interviewed him. He said it was a, it was a movie once, remember? Anyway, um, th that was 20 or 30 years before the faking show. Um, thank you, Mia Feynman. From now on, I'm, called the, I'm being called a faker. Uh, but my faking, manipulating, posing, and pasting, and, and many of my ideas 50 years before work, uh, Photoshop was my method of visually depicting a penetrating selling idea in a simple, powerful way whose message could be understood in a nanosecond. The first hint of what I was going to do in my life was when I was, a, um, I was 21 years old. I was a couple of weeks back from fighting in Korea. And I had a dream job at CBS television, working for the great, legendary uh, William Golden. A year before he had done, a couple of years before he had done the CBSI. Um, and my first job was to do a poster and, a, um, and an ad for the Triple Crown that the, that the uh, CBS uh, television broadcasted. Um, I went to their files. Uh, downstairs, and there was a photograph of the of, of horses that the photographer had probably uh, taken at the turn of a track, so that for a split second, as they, they, they were turning, he got a photograph of the horses looking like they're coming right at you. And I saw that, and the next morning, five o'clock in the morning, I went to, Bel to Belmont. Uh, I laid on the ground in the dark, waiting for the sun to come up, I was, and, I was, and I shot the turf with my Leica, went back to CBS, took the negatives, put them together, and I got this incredible photograph of horses coming right at you, looking like they, were, they ran over the photographer and killed him. <laughs> Showed it to Bill Golden, and he said, oh my God, what a photograph, Which, what is that? And I explained how I did it. You know, and, and uh, I said, well, wait, wait, how'd you get that idea? I said, uh, well, I said, uh, it's like the uh, Lamentation Over the Dead Christ painting by uh, Andrea Mantegna, you know, where, you, where he shot, he did an incredible painting of looking at Christ's legs, and, and in, in, in extreme perspective, you saw his face, you know, you, you know looked like the yards behind. He said, what are you... How'd you learn about Mantegna? What do you know about the Renaissance? And I said, I went to the High School of Music and Art for four years. The greatest, the greatest institution of learning since, uh, since Alexander sat at the feet of Aristotle. Um, I went on from CBS. I loved, I loved working with Bill Gunn. I went on and I did uh, uh, advertising images. Uh, uh, go, Luke. 
Um, this is all without uh, uh, the workshop, of course. You know, I would have loved to have a workshop for that. And I did ads like the next one. Um, um, I could have put that together in two pictures, but I felt that I had, had a post for it myself. That was my hand. <laughs> I like to put myself into my work. <laughs> um, Ty, now Ty's made for eaters. Uh, and uh, these ads, some of these ads were done at Daryl Dane Burnback, which, uh, which was the only creative agency in the world back then, literally the only creative agency in the world. You gotta understand that all advertising until Daryl Dane Burnback was created, uh, the art director, so-called art director, was sitting in a room with a stump up his ass, waiting for a copywriter and an and account man to bring a uh, copy for him to, do, and to, do an ad, to lay out an ad. Um, and, and Doyle Dane changed all that when they, they, when they put talented graphic people together with talented writers. Uh, uh, Bill Burnback said he would put him in the room, lock the door, and, w and would wait to, until he uh, and would not unlock the door till, until he came out with great advertising. Um, so that was Doyle Dane Burnback, another one that Doyle Dane Burnback. Uh, for IOTW. And then I started my own ad agency. I left Doyle Dane Byrne back in 1960, the first week of 1960, and started my own ad agency. It was the first ad agency that had the name of an art director that was founded by an art director. And it, and it broke through the what was going on in this field, and all of a sudden the art director had come to power. Uh, first ad for an analyst thought, oh, you don't have a cold, I don't have a cold. You have an allergy. I have an allergy. <laughs> Next, another analyst did. Uh, then uh, a, a couple of uh, Wolfsmith ads. This is a uh, Wolfsmith bottle, kind of a, trying to uh, trying to get into the pants of a of a tomato. And, um, and then, then he got, that was one week in Life Magazine, and the next week in Life Magazine, uh, he uh, really started to, to go to it, slightly, slightly phallic symbol. Um, uh, headed for the navel of the orange, and uh, he's, and he's uh, making love to her. And the orange said, who was that tomato I saw you with last week? You know? <laughs> and then an ad that really shocked, uh, shocked the world, the next one is, uh, just shocked the advertising world. You know, a, a black darkened room, I told it was, uh, I had taken that photograph. Um, uh, John, is that Billy coughing? Get up and give him some cold. And that, it, and that, there's a whole discussion went on in America about about the male chauvinism and how men treat their wives, et cetera. But sold the sold the hell out of the product. Everybody advertised it went into shock. Uh, and, and and another another couple, uh, the Norga may be ugly, but his vinyl high was is beautiful. And then I convinced women to, uh, and, I, and then I convinced women that uh, lipstick can make them beautiful. Uh, Howell Hayes, the, uh, the newly appointed art uh, 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 editor of, et of Esquire magazine, had been watching my work and reading about me in the Times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, about this art director that was running an ad agency and doing the, uh, terrific creative work. And he came to me and he, and he had lunch with me and he said, I wonder if you could help me and what can I do for you? I wonder if you could help me figure out how to do better, uh, better uh, magazine covers. How do you do them now? And he explained a, a method where they all used to get, they, everybody got together once a month and he discussed which, which um, a story would be, should be made into a cover and then they would all go away and uh, all would come back with four or five ideas and then they'd come up and say, oh my God, group fucking group, you know? <laughs> well, you gotta give it to one person. You don't have anybody there who knows how to do it, so you gotta give it out. Well, how can I give it out? How can I give it out to somebody who doesn't understand my magazine? I said, anybody. I said, any great, talented guy, could, could do a great, have a great cover sphere. He said, and then I, and then he said, finally, he said, no, no, no. He said, well, listen, you gotta do me a favor. You gotta do me one cover. So, I didn't realize this when I did the first cover, but they were in deep, deep financial trouble. Um, but even so, I, know I, had, I knew I had to do a cover that knocked everybody on their ass. So what I did, uh, one of the stories in the, in the upcoming issue, and I had three days to do it, was, uh, Floyd Patterson was fighting Sonny Liston. Floyd Patterson was a heavyweight champion. He was an eight to one, a nine to one favorite over Liston. 
And um, everybody knew, was sure that Floyd would knock out, would, would beat uh, Liston. I knew they were wrong. I knew Liston would destroy him. So I did a cover that would come out a week before the, the fight uh, uh, in, in Vegas. And I showed, supposedly showed, Floyd Patterson laying dead in the ring. Not only laying dead in the ring and defeated, but left for dead. Uh, everybody leaving him, right? You're kind of a metaphor, not only for boxing, but a metaphor for any job in, in, in the world when you, you know, when you lose your job or when you're defeated, you know, everybody forgets you. Um, I didn't realize at the time there was a giant fight at the, at the, uh, at, uh, at Esquire and the editor, the publisher, uh, told Harold Hayes that he could not run it. Harold Hayes, I found out later, said, if you don't run this cover, I'm quitting. And they ran the cover. Not only did they run it, uh, but in the issue, the publisher had a page that said, you see that cover? We had nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, a young designer by the name of George Lois did it. We don't agree with a thing, anything about it. Uh, what happened is a week later, the, the fight took place. I was nervous as hell. My wife came into the room and said, what's wrong? What's wrong, hot shot? <laughs> I said, I'm not, I'm not nervous about the fight. I'm nervous about the color of his trunks. <laughs> because I took a guess that Floyd would wear black trunks. And, and it, you know, in those days with black trunks, white trunks, you know. And uh, when I, and when I was watching the fight and, and out came uh, uh, Liston, at first into the ring, and they took off his robe and he was wearing white trunks. That's the first time in my life that I thought that there possibly really could be a god. <laughs> so it was a giant success, and, and, uh, and, um, and Harold begged me to do, keep doing the covers. I said, I'll do them the covers as long as none of them ever get killed. If they killed, I'm gone. I, I'm gone. However, two months later, a cover did get killed. This is 1962, and I wanted to do a cover that said, Merry Christmas, I'm the 100th GI killed in Vietnam. I'm talking about way before the escalation of the war. I knew it was gonna be a shit war. I fought in a shit war called the Korean War, where we committed genocide on Korean people, and I knew, it, I knew this war was gonna commit genocide on the Vietnamese people. Uh, Harold was scared to death of it because he thought that by the time Christmas was, came, we would be out of Vietnam. Uh, so this is the only cover actually that got killed, and I kind of agreed to kill it because I was maybe it could have been right. But anyway, after this cover ran, um, uh, 54,000 GIs got killed. Um, um, and then I did that, and then the next cover, or one of the covers I did was, um, this was interesting. My wife knew that I, had to, I wanted to do a cover on Cleopatra, and that was, a, you're all too young, but back then there was such a stupid thing going on with, with the, you know, uh, Taylor who was married to uh, Eddie Fisher, and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, Burton is Boffiner, and the whole thing was going on, and left all kinds of stupid stuff. So um, it, it was all ridiculous. So I, and my wife saw this poster where she was, coming home for, with uh, one of my sons. And she said, oh, there's a, a poster going up in the Rivoli Theater. So when I came home that night, I, I went by it, and there it is. Uh, but they had already painted, almost finished the whole painting. So I went back there the next morning, gave, gave each of the guys uh, paint, side painters $10, $10 and, uh, to go back up and, and, uh, and uh, touch up the tits. Um, uh, that, the, uh, uh, this thing, uh, you don't, yeah, I can't even start to explain to you what happened with this. It, it, was, a time, it was a time of incredible racial tension in America. Um, uh, 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 Eldridge Cleaver, the Black Panthers, etc. Black men were, were becoming militant and, and you know, f fighting back, not taking any more shit from the white man. Uh, and liberals were saying to me, hey, George, you know, these black guys are getting kind of violent here. So what I did is I, I figured, let me show the baddest son of a bitch that ever lived, Sonny Liston, as Santa Claus. Not only was it, and you gotta understand this is, Jim Crow South was still going on, this is 60, 62. 62, 
Jim Co 63. Uh, it was still the time of the Jim Co stuff. Then Cassius Clay at that time saw the cover and he said, hey, George, uh, that's the last black motherfucker white America wants to see coming down that chimney. Um, uh, the, the next cover is, um, I love this cover. It, it wasn't, it, it, it's amazing because what happened with the circulation, it went from about 350,000 to 2 million. I mean, it was a phenomena. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 the, and the sales on the newsstand were incredible. Uh, this was one of the lowest selling covers I ever did on the newsstand. And it, I love this cover so much because what I did is I found there was stories about the Indians, uh, about the Indians, and, and many terrific stories in the issue. And uh, the Indian nickel, you know, one, of the most one of the most beautiful coins in, in, ever created, Buffalo on the other side. Uh, I, I, and, I found, and I looked up, I did some research and found out that the, man, that the Indian who post fit was still alive, brought him down from Syracuse, flew him down on Mohawk Airlines, by the way. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and Chief Johnny Big Tree became uh, very famous. He did, did all the talk shows, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next to it. Um, this is uh, about a, a year after our great president, uh, Jack Kennedy, was killed. And there's a trump lay of a hand drying, either drying the, his own, the tears of the man who was drying the, the, the portrait, or maybe possibly the, the tears of Jack Kennedy. Next one, Luke. This was um, pre-feminist uh, revolution, but you just knew, it just knew women weren't gonna take any more shit. And, uh, and, and, and Harold Hayes did a, had an article on the masculization of the American woman. So I figured, what the hell, I'll have a shaven. Um, I could not get any American actress to pose shaving. I mean, I tried them all. Uh, and I finally had to get a, an Italian actress, Verna Lisi. Uh, uh, years later, I think I have it in there, I ran into, uh, I was shooting uh, Kim Novak, and she said, oh, you're the, are you the guy that did that, that Verna Lisi cover of shaving? I said, yeah. She said, why the fuck did you ask me to do it? Um, well, you're all too young. I mean, it's shocking. This is Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan is the guy that put the Beatles on for the first time in America. And you know, at, at first he actually put on Elvis, except that he, they, the camera didn't go below his, 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 uh, his chest. Because you know, that was dirty stuff he was doing. But, um, anyway, so uh, uh, my wife and I are watching Ed Sullivan's show. He had a, he had a Ed Sullivan was a, was a writer for the, for the news, but he had a, a, a variety shows, the craziest variety show of all time. He had, he did some great stuff, and then he had, did, uh, did uh, you know, monkeys talking. It's a crazy show, but anyway, he he introduced the Beatles, and I looking at it that on a Sunday, and I said, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta get him to pose in the Beatles uh, with a Beatles on his head. It would look so, he would look so wonderfully foolish, you know. So I went to Bill Paley, who was the head of CBS, and, he, and Paley uh, tried to get him to uh, get Sullivan to do it for me. And he said, no, nah, no, nah, no, I, George, I love your work. I love it. I love everything you do. I love your covers, but no fucking way, right? So what I did is I went down to uh, the other Sullivan Theater, and I had designed that, the, the signing for that when I was at CBS, and uh, waited with a bunch of kids like a jerk. And he came out of the theater, and uh, I showed him a sketch. I said, blah, 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 I want to shoot you with it. He said, terrific. Next morning, we shot it, and there he is. Kill Luke. Oh, this infuriated America. Uh, 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 there were a list of about 100 uh, people, uh, men and women, that um, college students uh, uh, you know, loved. And so I used Bobby Dylan. Malcolm X, Castro, and Kennedy, Jack Kennedy. Oh, it infuriated people. You gotta understand, like, a lot of these covers, um, every time I ran a cover, they would lose four or five advertisers. <laughs> um, but, the, but the next month, they would pick up five more, and meanwhile, the circulation was going through the roof. Uh, I, I would, 
I, I would sometimes warn I, Harold. I would, I would do the cover, send it to him. I said, Harold, this time we're going to get into big trouble with this cover. And he would say, yeah. <laughs> go, go next. Oh, boy, this, this one made trouble. Um, these are the words of somebody uh, in uh, M Company uh, in Vietnam. Oh my God, we hit a little go. Well, when I did this cover, uh, Congress went crazy. Senators got up and screaming about Esquire. How could you, how could you, have Congress and saying, how, how could you dare imply that American GIs would, would kill civilians? I said, huh? It's called war. When, you, when our leaders, when our bum leaders, you know, send young guys like me into, into warfare, man, you shoot everything that moves. I didn't, didn't get it, you know. But th you gotta understand, this was a, an incredible anti-war cover in a mass magazine in 1966, and this was maybe, maybe only about 5,000 GIs had been killed by that time. And, and of course, uh, it was, was 50,000 plus. Um, ah, boy, it's hard to explain this to young people. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 Hubert Humphrey was a great U.S. senator um, from Wisconsin. From from Wisconsin, from Minnesota, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, we all loved him, but he became the vice president and he spent four years kissing uh, LBJ's ass. Uh, and um, it, and he, when, uh, when LBJ came in and said that he would get, end the war, what happened is the war got worse and worse and worse. And I was furious with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, um, Hubert Humphrey, so I have him as a dummy saying I have known for 16 years his courage, his wisdom, his tactics, and his leadership, and then you open the, open the flap and you, know, you tell him Hubert. <laughs> now, this is, this is a real, um, this is before, as I said, before Photoshop, you know, putting this together. I, I had people actually say to me, how did you get Lyndon Johnson to pose for that? Next one, next one, Lou. Um, oh, there was something about that cover. I was in, um, go, go back one, Lou. I was in the vice president, I was in Humphrey's office not too long after this. And uh, when I was brought in to be uh, introduced to him, this was hanging in his ante room with his secretaries. And I said, Mr. Vice President, before we go, on, go any further, I did that cover. And he said, what do you mean you did the cover? Blah, blah, blah. And then when he realized what I did, he said, uh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I said, so why do you have it hanging out there? He said, it's just to remind me that you were right. <laughs> Next, Luke. Um, there's a story behind this one. Harold, uh, he had all kinds of pressure, Harold Hayes, from the advertising directors. Even though the sales were going up and the advertising was going up, and um, they still wanted people still wanted girly covers, because Esquire had been built on, on doing girly covers, girly drawings, actually some great ones by George Petty. And, um, and I refused. And then finally I said, I said to Harold, Harold, uh, I give in. I'm gonna send you a, a girly cover. In fact, she's gonna be nude on the motherfucking cover. <laughs> That's, that was it. He called me up and he said, you didn't disappoint me, Lois. <laughs> Next one. Um, oh boy, another thing I have to explain. Truman Capote threw a black and white ball. You got, it's hard to explain what happened, but he, people, uh, everybody, in, in, uh, any celebrity, every celebrity in America wanted to be invited. Um, and it got to the point where people were saying, well, I, I was invited, but, I, but I, I'm not accepting. And the Times, the New York Times, ran a two full pages with the, with the actual list of the people that were invited. I mean, I'm talking about a dumbed down society, you know. Uh, in any case, a year later, there was, I did a parody on it, and I had, uh, I had uh, you know, including Kim Novak, a lot of very famous people there, Casey Stengel, saying we wouldn't have come, even if you had invited us to Capote. Go ahead. Um, um, this is a year after, um, 
there was uh, there was an actual uh, you know Jack Ruby literally killed Lee Oswald uh, on television. Boy, you know how much it's it's so hard to explain to a young audience. I mean, when you look at that, do you do you get it like that? No, too young, huh? Yeah. You missed a lot of great shit. Okay. <laughs> Dead Luke. Roy Cohn, I don't know if you know who Roy Cohn is. The stupid, the, 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 I hate the motherfucker. I can't tell you how, how much I hate him. He, he, uh, he was, he was Joe, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy's lawyer. And when I did, and, he, and uh, how was going to excerpt some uh, 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 story uh, stuff from his book. So I, I had, him, had him come and I had him pose and he knew that I had him pose with a self-imposed halo over his head. Uh, and he said, I bet you're gonna pick the ugliest one. And I said, you bet your ass, okay. <laughs> Go, Luke. Um, this became a, a truly uh, an important and very iconic uh, 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 image of, of Muhammad Ali. Uh, Muhammad, um, it, it was at a time when every, I tell you, uh, I tell you, America hated him. Black people hated him because he changed his religion from Christianity to Islam. Uh, he, uh, a lot of white people hated him because he had a big mouth. I loved him. Um, uh, um, and then when he, he refused to fight in a bad war, in a terrible war, the Vietnam War, uh, he was sentenced to go to, to, uh, to jail and his case was up at the Supreme Court and he was waiting um, uh, you know, a, a, a decision. So I showed him as a martyr. Um, in, it was um, uh, when I when I was when he was posing for me with the arrows on his body. He said, "Hey George," I said, "What do you want?" "Hey George, what do you want?" "Hey George," I said, "Okay, what do you want?" He said, he, and, he, "And he pointed to each arrow and he said, Lyndon Johnson, General Westmoreland, Robert McNamara, all of the people that were." trying to put him in jail for the rest of his life. You know. Next loop. <laughs> Richard Nixon had lost the election to John F. Kennedy four years before because he, he looked as evil as he really was. You know, he, had a black, <laughs> he had a five o'clock shadow, et cetera. So, and, 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 and this was an article saying, hey, he's good. it looks like he's gonna run again. You know, this, this, and I said, this is his last chance. This time, it better look right. And I have him being made up. Um, the uh, Ron Ziegler, who was his press secretary at the time, called up Howard Hayes, and he's, and he's screaming at him. And then Howard Hayes said, what's the, what's the problem? He said, I know what you commie sons of bitches are trying to do. You're trying to make Nick, Richard Nixon look like a homo. <laughs> you figure. Um, uh, 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 Jack, Jack Kennedy had been killed in 62 and, and Dr. King was uh, assassinated in 68 and the, not a couple of months later, Bobby Kennedy in the middle was assassinated. I, I did Bobby Kennedy's uh, Senate campaign when he ran for the Senate in uh, New York State. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, a kind of a shocking uh, Apotheosis of uh, you know a resurrection of, uh, of of three great leaders. Go, go do. Now now talk. Now, let me go back to that. that th think about Photoshop with that one. I had to find th three photographs of the of of the men with the same lighting. Then I got the bodies. I got the uh, body types to pose. Uh, had to take, shoot the photograph of the. Uh, of the three men at Arlington on, on site. And then I had to do a paste up and, a, and, a, and, and I had to print all the images and heads in place, et cetera, and do the blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it took, you know, it was a big, big, big job to do. With Photoshop, I could have done it in, uh, you know, 10 minutes. Um, Again, 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 explaining who these guys are. Jean, Janet, Williams Burroughs, uh, Terry Southern, John Sack, uh, covering the 68 election uh, convention uh, when, when, uh, when, uh, the, the, when millions of, of American kids were yelling, the whole world is watching, the whole world is watching. Boy, that was terrible times. Go, go Luke. 
talk about faking it. Howard Hughes, this was Ir the Clifford Irving thing I did in the morning, forget about it, okay. Um, Howard Hughes was this, this billionaire, and, every, and uh, they're doing this plan, this crazy thing where nobody knew where he was, he didn't know where he was there, he didn't know, people thought that he was locked up and he had fingernails 14 inches long, though, is he alive, is he dead, who knows what's going on. So what I did is I, I faked it, and I have Hughes, um, um, you know, with the, uh, with the robe on, uh, his wife, Jean Peters, is coming out of a pool. There's kind of his bodyguard is waiting, and all of a sudden, we're, we're in the bushes, and, and, and they see us, and, and they start running, they're yelling at us, and, they, and, they, and they're running after us, blah, 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 blah. And we printed it. We said, I, I said, Howard Hughes, we see you. We see you. I'm telling you the world. I, we know where he is, right? The AP came out two days later exposing the fact that it, the photographs were fake. And they, they, asked me, they asked me about it, and I said, duh. <laughs> Go, Luke. I better hurry. Um, uh, they, um, I, I call up Andy. I said, Andy, I want to put you on. Andy well, loved my covers. He used to call me up every other cover and tell me how much he loved them. And I said, Andy, I want to put you on a cover of Esquire. He said, ooh. He said, I'm talking about that. <laughs> ooh. He's talking about the fact that George Lois is going to put me on the cover of Esquire. He said, wait a minute, George. I know you. What's the idea? I said, Andy, I'm going to have you drowning in a giant can of Campbell's soup. He said, oh, I love it. And then he said, but well, won't you have to build a gigantic can? I said, schmuck. Take a picture of the fucking can. Take a picture of you drowning. And I put it together. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you got to understand uh, what was going on in those days. There were millions of, of kids and millions of, of young people who, who were d d protesting the, the, uh, the, the uh, Vietnam War. And, uh, and the cops all over, cops in every city, every state were kicking the shit out of kids. So we, I did a thing, the kids versus the pigs. And the police forces all over America went crazy. Screaming, and the people, the people was doing their advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, the circulation was going up. And um, it got so serious that I felt that I had to personally apologize. So I wrote, sent out a press release, and I, I didn't apologize to the cops, I apologized to the pigs <laughs> for calling them cops. Get it? Okay. <laughs> go, go, Luke. Uh, oh, boy. Um, uh, th th uh, this was a story about uh, you know the new American uh, new American religion uh, you know uh, for, for actually kid, uh, kids new new religion uh, and that I got it the marquee of a, of, a, of a movie house playing the Easy Rider slapped it on top of St Patrick's uh, Cardinal Cook was not amused <laughs> go Luke. Um, uh, Lieutenant Callie is the, is, the young, is the young lieutenant who was responsible for uh, killing 500 men, uh, young, uh, old men, uh, women, and children uh, in a, a place called My Lai. And um, uh, even though, you know, uh, you have to ultimately blame the, the, lead, the, uh, pres the people who sent uh, GIs into these kind of places. That doesn't mean that you have to be a psychopath, and I thought he was a psychopath. So I, I, I took a photograph of him, a solemn photograph of him with the children he killed, and um, very, and finally at the end of it, I, and I, of course at the beginning he didn't want to pose, at the end of it I said, oh, Rusty, his nickname. Oh, Rusty, that was terrific, you know, terrific. Now let me, give me a one, give me a shit, give me a great shit eating grin. And he grinned, and that was the money shot, because I wanted him grinning amongst the, kill, the people he killed, the young people he killed, the, the babies, etc. Go, go, Luke. Good, 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 good. Uh, let me, I'll end with this. Um, uh, it's hard to kind of explain this, too. 
Norman Mail and Jermaine Greer, Jermaine Greer was a feminist, and they had shit fights together on TV screaming at each other. So, uh, and, at the, and in the same issue, there was a, 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 there were stories about the original King Kong movie. So I had Norman Mail opposing as King Kong, and, uh, and uh, with Jermaine Greer, uh, you know, wishing they would cohabit, I guess, you know. Um, Norman Mailer called, called um, Harold Hayes and said, uh, and, set, and, and challenged him to a fight. And, Norman, and Harold Hayes said, look, you know I have nothing to do with those covers. George Lois, it's his fault. <laughs> and he gave him my phone number. <laughs> Harold Hayes called me up and he said, uh, Norman Mailer's gonna call you, he wants to fight you. Um, I said, I said, if there's a God in heaven, I, I'll get to fight him, you know. Um, anyway, the next, I, I get a call from Mailer, we make a date to meet in the park. Uh, you know, it's at 57th Street and 5th Avenue near the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Nika and uh, General Sherman thing, uh, 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 your know, uh, sculpture by uh, Chester Daniel French. And, uh, oh no, it's Augustus St. Gordon's. And, uh, and uh, we made a date to, to meet at eight o'clock in the morning and I'm still waiting. <laughs> I, I think I, I gotta end now, it's 10 to 10. Uh, any questions? Do I have time for questions? Yeah. <laughs>